Hello, everyone. Thanks for coming to our talk. First, let us introduce ourselves. I'm the guy on the left. I'm originally coming from the Czech Republic. I've been doing application security since 2007. I started with Secure DLC in 2008. In 2011, I moved to Germany to work for One and One, where I'm currently leading application security team in a division uh, which uh, develops and operates portals, including uh, WebDA, JMX, and Med.com. Yes, hello, and my name is René Reuter. Um, I'm working in information security till 2011. Um, I worked together with Daniel at One in One and left One in One in March, but we are still working together for the project we are going to show you today. Yep. So uh, let's try to begin um, about what we are trying to achieve or why we actually started developing something. If you um, test um, applications yourself for security, you probably experienced the situation that you test one application, you find quite a lot of low-hanging fruits like missing HTTP headers, uh, tr um, trace method enabled and so on. And then you move on to the next penetration test and you find exactly the same findings and on and on. So and um, these common security requirements, they often get forgotten and during the time you find out that there are actually quite a lot of um, security requirements being forgotten according to properties of the applications, what you're testing, according to teams and so on. And um, the idea is that actually these security requirements, we should make sure that they fit the development workflow. So when you're addressing your normal functional, non-functional security requirements, um, you should also specify the security ones. And as the development world gets more and more automated um, throughout the time, then it's quite clear that we need to automate as well. Um, as for the security requirements themselves, which kinds of requirements we actually know? So the first one are quite, uh, and the first type is quite obvious. These are something like security properties of the system you are just building. So things like you are using prepared statements in st instead of SQL concatenation, or you are setting HTTP headers, and so on. But um, the Second thing, what is actually um, security requirement for us, are um, certain lifecycle activities. So if you are building an artifact, let's say, or an application, you should uh, make sure that you follow certain procedures. And what these two things have in um, common is that if you work some with some kind of ticketing system like Jira, for instance, then in the end of the day, both of these types of requirements land in the same ticket systems, but most probably in different ticket queues. So let's say if your security team has an, um, its own ticket queue, where are things like do a pen test for me, um, um, add this art artifact to our vulnerability management, and so on. And um, on the other hand, you have a dev queue where you say, okay, set these HTTP headers, or your ops queue, and, 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 and so on. And um, how, when we began with um, SDLC at one and one basically the first thing um, I did was that I took ASVS, awesome projects, and then I went to developers because they asked me, okay, I'm developing a new application, so what should I make sure that I don't forget? And I showed them ASVS, and uh, I, they didn't really react very friendly because they said, okay, and if I, Okay, I will go through, uh, with you through that list once. But in the end, you find out, okay, there are like 100, 180 requirements currently, and you will find out that for your use case, maybe only 60 or 30 are actually relevant. So, um, also what, what I find out during the time was that um, ASVS, for instance, is quite a lot focused on QA, actually, rather than on the proactive view so um, when you talk to a developer according to ASVS, then you, then, um, you say first requirement, and you say second requirement. He was like, okay, is this for me the same thing? I'm, I'm addressing this requirement. Uh, I already explained to you how I do it. So there is some optimization potential. And the second thing 
which I mentioned, the filtering potential. So depending, if, uh, depending on if, uh, whether I'm developing a web service, uh, front-end web application, JavaScript client, mobile app, certain requirements are not relevant for me and certain are. So uh, what we were trying to, how we are trying to implement our idea was um, that um, we have obviously developed a tool which we call Security Red, Security RAT for Requirement Automation Tool. And uh, what we do with uh, requirements, we observe them on an artifact level. So what is an artifact for us is usually deployable, but sometimes it can be also like say library, which gets shared among more applications. So um, this is something what we found out. This uh, works quite well also with the more agile methodologies. And how do we address these? Of course, the best way is to do this when you are creating uh, actually a new application or a new artifact. So the moment where you know, okay, I'm going to develop something is the most efficient way, obviously, to think about security, what I need to address. But uh, what we also um, started doing, meanwhile, quite a lot, are something like gap analysis, where we go over our legacy software, and we, during an interview or during a fast test, uh, we go through the requirements, which are, in theory, relevant. And then we find out, OK, have you thought of these? Have you thought of those? And then we find it identified to do's, and the development teams need to address them. Regarding the workflow, how does it work? So we have here our tool, and we have some security role. Uh, in our organization, we call this security role a security mentor, and we have one security mentor per development team. And the first thing you do is that you define the artifact. So what I'm going to develop, is it a web service, mobile app, um, is it critical piece of software, how does the authentication work, does it have session management, is this internally, externally available, and so on. You get some requirements, and then you define, okay, what are you going to do with these? And what we do afterwards, we have a, let's say, special Jira queue, where we persist these properties as, an, as YAML attachments. So you can always can have a look, okay, what are the security requirements which certain artifact should fulfill. And once you have this, what you can also do is that because you will find out that certain requirements out of these will generate actually issues. So you can automate this actually very, very easily and uh, place these um, uh, issues in a batch mode in the right um, uh, queues according to their properties. And the final and, let's say, most favorite thing, especially by management, is that if you have all this information, you can actually report out of this. So you can say, OK, it was agreed that this application would fulfill certain requirements. So then, and you can always get the status of the Jira tickets and say, OK, has it actually been done or has it been refused? Is it still open? So um, that's theory. Now Rene will show you how does it look like. So I hope the demagogues will be with us. Hopefully everybody can hear me now. I have to apologize that I do not stand in front of you. This is because um, the duplicate mode of the presenter is not working. We have to use the extended mode. This is why I have to look up when I show the demo. Also, I'm going to show a live internet demo. You know all Murphy's Law. So I'm kindly asking you to not use the Wi-Fi at the moment. <laughs> okay, let's have a look at our tool. So this is our tool. I just do a reload. To us, well, no, this is not our tool. <laughs> so here it is. At the moment, we are using CAST to authenticate. Um, the, on the server is running OpenCAST from Aperero, um, and I already authenticated against this, and my role currently has the admin role. But there are also user roles you can have, but I'm at the moment an admin. So what I do at the beginning, I say I want to define a new artifact as an example. As our Daniel already told, we have a lot of filtering possibilities. So let's say it's a new cool tool. And 
uh, O-tool. So, and we have, have to define some filtering arguments. Let's say criticality perspective, it's a medium application. Artifact type, um, it's a front-end application. And authentication will be done via a single sign on client or centralized. If you do not know what kind of types these are, we always provide help with a tooltip where everything is explained what's behind it. So if someone does not understand the concept behind it. So let's assume we are going to have a single sign-on client. Session management will be done via session IDs. And reachability from our front-end application is externally. It's not internally. At least we have to specify the implementation type. Currently, we have three types we can specify. Internal means the application is internally developed and internally hosted. External means um, the application is developed by an external vendor, but is hosted internally. And cloud means externally developed and externally hosted. So for this use case, we are choosing internal developed. Just hit generate, and the tool will automatically find the requirements which fit to those kind of filters. At the moment, we have 51 requirements found. And what you see here is a short name for a requirement, a description for a requirement, more information where you can find more deep information about the requirement. Next column is motivation. So why should you do that, that requ security requirement? And we have a so-called status column, in this case, strategy. Strategy means for every requirement, um, the customer has to say if he fulfills the requirement. He can either say it's a task, so we have to do it because it's currently missing. Implicit means some third party framework um, do this for us. Refused means we're not going to do this. Clarify means actually we are not sure at the moment. We have to check back with some local experts if, if this requirement is met in our artifact or not. And irrelevant means, OK, this is completely out of scope and doesn't fit in our application. As Daniel mentioned, the first category here is lifecycle. Those are all the lifecycle requirements, like appoint a security mentor role. And if we scroll down a bit, stuff like perform and document a penetration test, so all lifecycle requirements. After that, there are technical requirements, which are mainly focused for the developers. So let's scroll down a bit. I do not want to show you everything, stuff like that. Session IDs are transferred in cookies only. You can get some information for the developers with Markdown, so they can easily understand what's in that requirement, what are the um, stuff I have to do as a developer. So, and you would go through that list of requirements with a lead architect and a lead developer of that artifact and comment in the comment phase, okay, is it relevant? Yeah, it's relevant, but we are not sure. We have to clarify that. So let's say clarify to be done. Also, the next thing, ah, we are not sure. Clarify to be done. So you go on every requirement step by step and fill it out. So in the end, what you can also see, it's 51 requirements, might be a lot of requirements, and it will destroy the developer if he sees it first. So you have the possibility here to filter in the tool. So stuff like we have tags where we can apply filters. It's, it's a client-side application, so filtering is only, everything is client-side here. Only the data is um, sent from the back end, but everything what we here do is client-side. So we can just easily type, okay, just show me only the lifecycle requirements I want to see, or let's see, I only want to see the technical requirements, or if you have in your um, SDL at your company some gates in your development lifecycle, you can filter directly by gate. But those, everything here is highly customable by the, uh, by the administrator. So you can edit everything you see here. It's not fixed. Even if you go through the, through the workshop and you see, OK, those requirements are really nice, but we are missing one special requirement because we have a really special implementation. You can easily say, OK, I want to add to my current requirement set my own requirement, because it's very special what we are doing here. So how about session management, some session stuff? And let's hit it. And you have to add a strategy. It's a task. And add that requirement. And if I filter again for session management and scroll down a little bit, you see our custom requirement I just added. 
So, but this, this is only client side. And as Daniel showed in the workflow, we have to persist it in, in some way. So we came up with the idea to persist it in a gyra. So you see the button save here is marked in red, means it's not saved. And as it's a client side app, the data will be lost if you're going to leave the tab. So you have to save. So for that, we have a running gyra here. I just copy the URL. And so what I can specify here, I can specify a ticket or a queue. If I specify a ticket, it will be directly imported into the ticket. If I specify a queue, a new ticket will be created for that. This is what I will do now. If I hit export first, it will show me, okay, this is a summary for the ticket, this description. It will ask Jira what kind of issue types does the Jira have. It, it's, it will communicate with the Jira API. And you can say, okay, this is a new artifact. Let's say it's a task and go on export. So now it says a new one is created. And we can have a look at it directly into Jira. What we'll see, a new ticket was created with the uh, name of our new cool O tool, as I mistyped it. And we see as an attachment, here's our YAML file attached. This is wh where the whole structure and all the requirements are inside the, the YAML file. And we are also doing some automating comments, which means, um, hey, this is a new artifact. You can directly import the attachment by clicking on that link. And the second link is for the newest version. As you are further developing your application, you're going to change your YAML file, and you will always update it into this ticket, so new attachments will be um, attached to the ticket. So let's import it again by just clicking the link. So and it will say, OK, it's imported for us. This is what we've done before. Uh, we see 22 requirements. Also, the new one we created is inside. Let's have a look, double check. There's the one we just created. OK, so now we saw, OK, we have now um, exported our artifact. We should now export the tickets to the devs. What I've done in strategy, I, had, I have marked two as clarify. We weren't sure, so the developers have to clarify those. So I just filter for the ones I clarify, where the strategy is clarified. This is two. And say, OK, select them all. And action with those selected, create Jira tickets for me. Again, I will be asked to enter a Jira queue. In this use case, you normally specify a developer queue. Here for the demo, we have one Jira instance running, so I'm using this, the same Jira queue. So after just create tickets, it will do it will tell me, OK, what issues are those? OK, those are, again, let's say bugs. Um, we add two labels to the tickets. We can also add custom labels, look, stuff like that, for the developers, like the project name, whatever, and just hit Create Tickets. And you see two tickets were created. And when we are looking in one of this ticket, we will see um, our labels we created with a description is a whole requirement with the requirement description, the more information, and the strategy for the developer. Also, we are doing a link to the SDLC artifact that you always link back to it. The same is for the main ticket. Uh, is this the main ticket? No. Let's have a look at the main ticket. This is the main artifact ticket. And here we will also see the new tickets were created. So now there's some kind of report time for the security mentor. So I will just import the tool, uh, the, t uh, the artifact again, and something changed now. <coughs> First of all, I see I can now select which version I want to import. As we are going to export the tickets, the main ticket was updated automatically. And we see now with the timestamp, there are two attachments in the main ticket. So I can select the newest, as this is a change with the developer tickets, and import that. And if I filter again for the clarify one, I see here status. And this is the status of the Jira ticket. So it asks the Jira queue, what is the status of this ticket? So here, the security mentor easily sees is there something marked as won't fix? Is there something marked as resolved? Or do I have to do something because the developers, there's a long open ticket? So it's easily for him to track down the status. Oh, no, I want 
here is my filter. Also, let's assume you're in a workshop with the, with the guys and you say, okay, the description is really nice from that requirement, but I do not like the more information. I do not understand that sentence, how to do that. There's an easily feedback button here where you can click and you will see the description and everything and there's a suggestion you can give back to the admin of the tool and say, please change wording, something like that. And if I click on submit, um, in an admin specified Jira queue, a ticket will be opened and will said someone asked for a change for a security requirement. And as admin, you can now decide to change it or not if you want. Also, um, in the, at the start, we defined um, the filters we see here, like medium, front-end applications, single sign-on session IDs externally. But sometimes, you may have decided wrong in the beginning. So how about now? Let's say it's not a medium criticality app anymore. Instead, it's a high. So criticality changed. So you can do that without any problems. Just hit generate. It will ask the backend again for the requirements, and it will came up with a with an, um, just modal and saying, OK, the change was successful. And to your current requirement set, null were updated, but new, nine new requirements were added to your current requirement set. Also, null were removed, because sometimes you can also downscale. You can say, instead, if you have a high one, you can downscale to medium. Then there would be uh, written nine were removed. So there were nine added at the stuff. Also, um, what's also possible, requirements, security requirements shouldn't be fixed. They should live, they sh should change over time, because there's always constant new vectors, constant new attacks. So, but we are on a client-side app. So if the uh, customer defined this kind of set and the project is running for two years, he's working two years with those kind of requirements. That shouldn't be the case. So let's draw here something. I'm an admin, and this is a simple CRUD interface we have for the back end. And here's my security requirement, appoint the security mentor role, and let's change it. Just add something like foobar to it. So let's wait. OK, it's now also written into the database. I can kill those tabs now. And where is my main ticket? NLP 26. So, and let's import it again. I'll just click on the link. Import it again. <coughs> again, let's import the newest version of it. So, and what happened, you now see a new red button popping up over here, updates available. And it's going to tell you updates for your current requirement set you are currently using is available. What we do is, every time you are going to import is, we will ask um, the back end and check with your current requirements if something has changed. So if he's going to say updates available, we see a summary where it's saying, okay, one new one requirement was updated for you, nothing were added, Sometimes new requirements get added or removed. And now he has to specify if he wants to approve the update or not. So in this case, the old one is marked in red. The new one with the FUBA is marked in green. And he has two buttons where he either decline the update or can say, OK, I want to approve it. Click on approve. And the new one is automatically updated in his requirement right now. So now we can work with an updated requirement set. So also, what we have done is, as everything is working on the client, and you see the button save is red, he hasn't saved his project, and let's draw the case Firefox was crashing. So you worked two hours going to every security requirements, didn't hit the save button, and Firefox crashed. So now tell uh, the lead developer and lead architect, uh, we have to do this again. They will say no. So this is why we came up with the idea to, it will also warn me if I didn't save it, but I explicitly say, okay, go out. Um, what we are doing, if you make a change and you're not saving it, every 30 seconds, we're doing a backup in your HTML5 local storage in the browser. So in the worst case, you're losing 30 seconds. So I can easily say those button, buttons were not here the first time I showed you the tool. I can delete the previous session or restore it, and then the previous session is easily restored with the foobar involved. If you're going to save it in the Jira ticket, we're going to delete the local storage because of data privacy. 
So you're not usually working always on your laptop. Maybe you're losing a laptop from your colleague. So if you're going to save, we are cleaning the local storage. So, and as a last use case I want to show you is, I've showed you for internal development. But what's with external development? First of all, you can't give an external vendor access to your tool and you can't uh, send him a YAML file. He will not understand that. So for this type, let's say, new external tool. Um, let's make it quick. It's medium, it's a mobile app, single sign-on. Those are not mandatory. You can also leave them out. Then you get a, uh, a standard requirement set, reachability extern, and implementation type external. Now let's hit generate again. It looks nearly the same. The only thing which has changed now is the uh, status column is changed from strategy to fulfilled. Because the external vendor only has to stay if this requirement is fulfilled, yes, no, unclear, irrelevant, irrelevant or partly. So, but now again, you have this kind of view here and a YAML file mm, doesn't work so well. So what I want to do is, we also have lifecycle requirements again here, but you do not want to give lifecycle requirements to an external vendor. They are usually tied to your internal development process. So, oh, sorry, wrong button. Let's just mark the technical ones. Those are 19 technical ones. Select them all. And instead of Jira tickets, I will create an Excel file. This is also the Excel file is generated on the client. No server communication involved here. And we're going to open up. Ah, yeah, sorry, it's on my screen here. <laughs> so let's move that across. We have an Excel file with um, the requirements, with the motivation, and also here with the drop down whether he has to say what he has to fill out here. And you now comment that it and we'll send it back to you. This is how you should def address security requirements with an external vendor. You should not give him access to your internal tool. Yeah, and switch back. In the end, this was it for the demo. Those are the use cases for our tool. I will do further with the slides, we'll go on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, for me the part is just to talk a little bit about the internals, um, about the tool. What is a tool? The tool is a, a so-called jhipster is the underlying framework. jhipster is a, just a Geoman generator um, used to create Spring Boot and AngularJS apps. Um, you can easily scaffold an app. So the admin interface I've shown you, that simple CRUD interface, it was just easily scaffolded after we uh, draw the data scheme. And I want to tell you a little bit about the data scheme because um, we programmed Security Red very generic. So you can do whatever you want with the requirements. Also the columns you saw, the names, stuff like that, you can easily customize that as an admin. So first of all, we have our requirements skeleton. This is a security requirement like written, you need to use a brute force uh, protection. Tied to a requirement skeleton is always a requirement category. For brute force is authentication. Also you saw the collections and every collection has a category. So for a requirement has um, a collection category criticality and you can select a low here. Also yeah, I showed you the tags like um, lifecycle, technical and some gates in your life, um, development life cycle. This one is technical tag, and the tag category is it's in requirement. Also, you can add some optional columns. This is more information, where you can give the developer more information about the security requirement. Also, you saw the status column for internal development. This is called strategy, but you can name it whatever you like. For external, we called it fulfilled. And you have an implementation type which is tied to a requirement skeleton if it's internally or externally or both. And what you can also customize, what I didn't show you is, you can add to an optional column, like more information, a so-called alternative sets. What are alternative sets? You can easily extend the more information with patterns. 
you saw that we used Markdown. So let's say you, have, you are mainly using uh, Java applications, so you can add directly as an alternative set Java code to more information. So, and when you generate the requirements, you will see in more information directly you can say select Java or any program language you want to specify and can show the developer some best practices in Java, stuff like that, which is also going to be exported and will be shown to him so you can easily adopt that. So this for the data scheme. Also, the ticket system integration I showed you with Jira. What do you need for that? Really hard is course because you need to add course header. Usually, you, do, you can't communicate with the Jira REST API without course headers because the same origin policy of the browser would kick in. So you need to add course headers for your ticket system. Otherwise, Security Red can't communicate with the API because Security Red inherits also the user rights. So if you're not allowed to create a ticket in a queue, Security Red is not able to do that because it's doing it with your rights you have. Also, you need to allow get and post for the ticket queue. And as a last thing, or not last thing, and Daniel will finish after set, the requirements set, um, you can do, you can start from scratch. You can define all your requirements by yourself, or you can use the default one we, we are going to provide, and which the one I've showed you here, we provide that as a My MySQL dump. This requirement set is mainly focused on web development and mobile applications. So we have released the tool I've just showed you on GitHub come two or three weeks ago, and currently it's two projects, Security Red, the actual tool itself I showed you, and Security Requirements. This is the default requirement sets, which you can just dump into your MySQL database to have the requirements I have shown here. So, and for the last 10 minutes, I will hand over to Daniel. Okay, so <clears throat> we presented current status. This is how the tool and the requirements uh, look now. What we are currently working on. Um, first thing, um, um, we hope to release next week, because we are almost done with that, is Docker image, so that you can easily ramp up. Just you download Docker image and everything's running inside of, of, the, of the container. Um, next thing we are working on is actually own user management because right now um, Security Red um, uses CAS because that's something what we use. And this is actually on one side, this is, this is cool because CAS is pretty robust and it means okay, you can just easily bind Security Red to your environment if you're using CAS inside, uh, inside it. Um, if you don't use CAS, um, this is a bit pain of the ass to configure it and uh, get, uh, get it running uh, quickly. So uh, we are hoping to solve that during summer. And um, last thing, obviously, uh, as a, every developer, we focus more on development rather than documentation. So the next current task also for us is to uh, create things like GitHub pages and, and so on in order for people to make it um, easier to, to ramp up. Then um, we have a few areas of further development. So first thing, obviously, we keep working on steadily and um, what you want to improve are the requirements themselves. So um, there are other things you can also like add to the requirements. So for instance, one thing we started with are uh, test cases where, for instance, um, Test cases from OWASP testing guide are, are linked, so how can you actually test this requirement? How can you verify whether it got fulfilled? You can, uh, we don't, um, in the moment, use the alternative sets, so Java patterns, framework patterns, and so on, telling you how to solve this, so this will be next era. Um, Parameterization of, of the requirements. So uh, you've seen a couple of texts, but there are actually a lot of possibilities. How, for instance, can I test it with a white box tool, black box tool, and, and so on, so, so that every role in your development process can actually filter what they need. And um, what we are current working all the time on um, is that we sometimes, after we do pen test and we find out, okay, something was actually not covered, we add a requirement. 
but at the same time, we want to prevent that we have too many of the requirements. So we are still, if we, for instance, have a requirement which have, has not been relevant for last year or so, then we kick it out because it makes us lower and it obviously doesn't bring anything. So this is um, the balance we are trying to achieve continuously, basically. And um, next thing, but that would be for the next version, we want to also do some changes to the data scheme so that it gets uh, a bit more flexible because we also got asked, meanwhile, by uh, quite a lot of stakeholders uh, in our company who uh, as, yeah, I would really like to use it, for instance, not only for security, but, but for more our, our processes, so in order to make it um, even a bit more universal. Next round of interest uh, integration, uh, is integration. So for instance, we integrated with Jira because we use it and that's it. But obviously not everyone uses Jira, so we want to support a different ticketing system, obviously. Next idea is that uh, maybe it doesn't work for everyone that you store, for instance, these YAML files in a queue, but you want to attach this uh, file to your technical concept or you maybe even want to generate your uh, security documentation according in your, in your wiki. So that will be next area, and um, one thing for us uh, which we are looking into is connecting this to some uh, testing either tools or scripts in order for the developers um, to, to be able to say, okay, I think I've implemented this, so verify this requirement if, it, if, it's, if it's now okay. So obviously this will be rather easy for things like HTTP headers, rather complicated for things like, for instance, cross-site sifting. Um, and obviously for the moment, there are actually three of us working on the tool. So it's Rene, it's me, and then it's uh, uh, my working student, who's also, to be honest, doing most of the work right now. <laughs> um, but we obviously, would like to bring this tool into the security community for people, of course, to use it, but if possible, also to contribute it. And some areas, how what is interesting for, for us are requirements. Right now, we are a lot on the, let's say, um, in the web application development area, but there are there is like embedded, there is anything. So um, these like your custom requirement sets which work for you or enhancement of requirement sets are, are interesting to us. Um, obviously, we have a um, lot of features we would like to implement and limited resources, so I think development is um, appreciated uh, the most, I would say. So if you want to have a feature, if you implement this yourself and contribute back, that would be just awesome. <laughs> and um, right now, we have tried to run this application in a couple of different environments. We always find some tweaks we need to work on, so even like test reports, if something's, something is or is not working for you, are, uh, are helpful, and if you really don't want to get your hands dirty, then at least tell us what is, what is interesting for you, how would you really like to use that tool, because we might say, okay, this is actually interesting for us as well, and uh, we will develop it ourselves. That will be basically it. There are some contact um, data. Um, if you have any ideas, feel free to contact us. There is the GitHub repository, very fine. And I think now we have a bit of time for questions. Thank you. Any questions? Um, so the question was how our user management uh, looks like. So for the moment, we have two roles um, defined in a, in a um, in database scheme. And there is the admin role, uh, which can alter the requirements, do also some configuration. And then there is um, basically uh, any user who is authenticated by CAS is like something what we call front-end user. And uh, front-end user is only allowed to generate requirements on, on his client and store it somewhere in Jira according to his rights, but is not able to modify anything on uh, security red. The next step for us is that we have um, also something like backend user, um, 
the difference between admin and backend user is that backend users will be able to change the requirements, but not the configuration of the tool, more system configuration. Uh, so, yeah, sorry. <laughs> See you. No, um, maybe, uh, so the question was, uh, what is the effort to add new requirements? Maybe you can show on the demo in the CRUD interface. It's um, basically, as Rene mentioned, we generated with the JAPSTER CRUD interface and um, edited a bit. So it's pretty normal, like create thing where you, where you say, okay, you want to create, depending on what you want to create, according to the data scheme, which uh, Rene presented. Um, so this is it, you can just... Oh, This is actually just the easy CRUD interface. You can select uh, the category. If you want to add a new category, you have to go to requirement category and add there a new category. But if it's going to fit in a category you already have, like session management, it's easily just a short name. It's kind of ID. Let's say SM0 or whatever, 999. A description, so just fill it out. Show order actually means um, how it's going to be sorted. So is it the first one in the uh, category or is it the last one or in the middle? It's just for um, filtering also a little bit. Um, universal ID you can provide. You don't need to provide it. We don't use it at the moment. It's more for future releases if you're going to need it. Only thing is active and non-active means you are going to keep this requirement active so the actual front end user will receive it or you can just store it in the back end but it's not active, it means the front end user doesn't see it. So active and now we have to apply the attacks we have so let's say it's a technical um, which is um, requirement owner is a security mentor, uh, you do not have to specify here everything and now to the collections, this is what you already saw when clicking on a new artifact. So let's say this is a low requirement for cr from criticality for front-end applications. You don't have to specify that, either not set, for uh, externally. And you can also multi-select if you want. You do not have to do single selects here if you have more. And actually just hit save and that's it to add a new requirement in the back end. So you can search. It's pretty much the same. We, it's CRUD interface, so we basically do this CRUD on the tables. So uh, here you have all the entities we do have, and you can uh, add, edit, modify the parameters as, as you want. To be honest, we didn't invest so much work into that yet, because obviously this is managed by admin, and what was important to us was that it's user-friendly, kind of, but um, that would be also like some nice to have feature, to have it more friendly, let's say. Thank you very much.